You're listening to The Basics of Church Membership, a Sunday school series taught by Pastor Rick Dressler at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. Uh, we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll, we'll review. And again, if, if this is your first time, or if you forgot from last time, um, you can stop at any time, ask any question you want, because we want to be a help to you, and we want, we want to... Um, we want you to know exactly what this church is about so that you know um, what you're getting into. And some of our folks who have been here for a long time have been coming too, which is a good refresher for them. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll begin, and uh, we'll work our way through the, the uh, lesson this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this day. I thank you for your kindness and your grace and the mercy that we have experienced um, from you, um, even this weekend with our teenagers, the safety that you gave us, and the good time together. Lord, I pray now this morning that we would tackle these topics in humility um, and in love and truth. And Lord, I just pray that the folks here would understand um, what the church is, who the church is, and the way it's supposed to function. So again, we thank you and we ask these, um, all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we're, we're going to review. We, we last week spent the entire time talking about um, where we came from. And then our culture, and I just want to hit this quickly because I think it's important, and um, we have some reconciliation going on right here, and, and Debbie's going to stay over there. All right. So um, we talked last week that, that um, I just want to get something out of here before I start, because I have, uh, nah. Okay. We started last week talking about the early church, the beginning of the early church. We'll talk more that, about that, actually, um, in a few minutes. But remember, when the early church began, from the beginning, uh, there were conflicts, there were problems, making sure that they were pure in their doctrine and their teaching. And, and many of our early books in the New Testament already tell us that there were issues and problems that the apostles were dealing with. And so it's no surprise, after time, that false teaching and false practices uh, make their way into the church. We said last week that everything changed with uh, Constantine in 313, the Edict of Milan. And, and what happened was Christianity, that, which was persecuted, which kept the church pure. Like, you weren't showing up to church because you knew if you did, you could lose your life. When that changes in the Roman Empire, it goes from 10% of the population, um, as far as saying we're believers, we're Christians, within 100 years to 90% of the population. And, and that's problematic. And so we see over time issues where the church starts to add practices and traditions that just aren't scriptural. So then East and West splits in 1054, with the East Orthodox having issues with the authority of the Pope uh, and an issue with the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And, and the West continues. That, so we, we follow our line to the West. And then in the 1500s, 1517, Luther and the Great uh, Reformation. And I just want to read a couple things. Because the point of last week was to say that we're not the new kids on the block. And not the group, the band, if you any remember that. Anyone remember the new kids on the block? All right. Yeah, sorry. And, um, but that's not who we are. And here's what Luther said during the Reformation. He said, we are not teaching anything novel. We are repeating and confirming old doctrines. And that's exactly what they were doing in the Reformation. And this is what John Stott said, a, a great scholar of today, um, or, or I think he's passed away. I want to argue that the evangelical faith is nothing other than historic Christian faith, uh, original, biblical, and apostolic Christianity. And he, it's true. So, so what we're saying is, during the Reformation, there was a call back to going back to the Word of God and to correct where the church had made mistakes. And so from that line, we, we have um, the Reformed tradition um, of Presbyterian, Congregational, Church of England. And, and that is the line that we, as a church, trace back to. Uh, we go back to John Smith. He was an Anglican priest I think the late 15, early 1600s, Anglican priests start reading the word, went from that to becoming a Puritan, and that wasn't good enough for him. He then became um, a separatist. And it was then when he realized 
from the Word of God that the church is for baptized believers. Um, it makes up a regenerate, uh, regenerated membership. From there, Roger Williams goes to America, Rhode Island, 1638. And then we, we trace that through, through fundamentalism in the early 1900s and neo-evangelicalism in 1940. And just so that you know, and we're in between, somewhere in between there as a church, but Baptists have, have contributed much to society. Um, literature, ever heard of a man named John Bunyan? Pilgrim's Progress, great Baptist. The Constitution of the United States, influenced by Baptist ministers. The idea of separation of church and state and uh, religious freedom. And then world missions through Adoniram Judson and Luther Rice, all Baptist concerned about reaching the world. And so we said last week that we are in the line of fundamentalism and evangelicalism. We sort of find our way in the middle. We're an independent Baptist church. Um, and, and let me just, I'm going to answer the question that was asked uh, last week about what are the pros and cons of, of having, uh, not being part of a fellowship. That was asked by Mark. He's not here this morning, but I want to answer that question, um, and I should be here. My notes are all scattered around because I was at youth conference, um, and I'm still recovering from that. <laughs> really. Uh, and so... The question came last week, like, okay, so we're not in a fellowship, we are not in a convention, we're not under a synod, so, so what are the pros and cons of that? And we, we sort of skimmed over that, but, but to, be in, to be in a church, in a fellowship, it does have its benefits. Um, one is it can run efficiently, because authority can do that. If there's one head that's giving out all the details, it can run cleanly. Not only that, they help in supplying ministers, um, money for missions, they own their own buildings, and so that's also helpful. Um, and when they're healthy, they can keep other churches in check. And so there can be a good thing about being involved um, in a fellowship or in a convention. But on the flip side, um, what about churches that are not connected, like independent churches? And I would, I would argue this, that independent churches are truly in line with biblical churches. In the New Testament, over and over again, that, that word we'll talk about today, ecclesia, church, um, it, it refers to, to local assemblies and congregations. Not only that, um, the congregation then makes decisions for their church. We don't take orders outside of our church and what we ought to be doing. And that's important. The congregation also decides where our money goes. We, we don't pay dues. We don't have someone else come and tell us what we're going to pay for. And again, that can be helpful, but we don't have to do that. We own our own buildings. And, and you might think that's not a big deal until the fellowship goes bad or the convention goes bad and they own your building and you don't want to go in that direction. You find out you no longer have the furniture. The divorce takes place and you lose everything. And it happens all the time, all the time. And then this, I think, is one of the most important things that for me, that in an independent church, which again, we have connections. We have other churches we fellowship. We just went down to a, up to a conference, and there were 500 young people there from churches all over the place. So we have these connections. But here's one of the things that I think are really beneficial, is this. There is not an organization outside this church that's going to force a pastor on us or take one from us. We don't have pastors to come in every three years. And some of you wish you did. But 21 years. Dan, 17 years. Right? And so other systems, they can force a pastor on the congregation that they don't want. And, and let me just say something to you. Um, for ministers, you don't see fruits like real fruit at least until maybe three, seven years, 10 years, 15 years. And, and, I, and, and churches can do what they want to do. I just don't understand how you build healthy communities and relationships with people you see for three years and you know they're going. I just So that's one of the benefits of being an independent, um, non-connectionalist type of church. And that's who we are. And I hope I answered that question from last week. Any questions on that? Yes, Trish. Um, it's going way, way back. But I've just always been curious. Because, like, the Catholic Church, they always say that the year was, like, their first youth. And I'm just curious, like, where that came from. Because the year is an apostle. 
Mm-hmm. It really doesn't follow like Catholicism. Right, exactly. And, and that's the authority they use to say that this is the, the main bishop because Peter was a pope. And the truth is, biblically, we have no record at all of Peter actually running a church. There. He may have been crucified in Rome. But this is the problem that the, the Eastern Church had in about a thousand years because what had happened was this, that, that popes started to take power, uh, uh, bishops, first bishops, because there are bishops in the Bible. But bishops became very localized, and so there were churches underneath them, which is not an unhealthy thing. But in Rome, the bishop of Rome, because it was the Roman Empire, that was the capital of the empire, he decided as time went on that it, that's, since I'm, the cap, I'm in the capital and, and this is an empire, I will just be in charge of all the churches. And so the idea of Peter being the first pope, we would not believe Peter would be mortified by that. A matter of fact, you should read... Um, 1 Peter chapter 5, where Peter says to elders, I also am a fellow elder. It would be an easy place for Peter to say, I am the bishop of everybody, and you should listen to me. He doesn't say that. He humbly says, I am an elder, and this is toward the end of his life, just as you are elders, and encourage them how to live their lives out. So that comes, it's a more, a more traditional thing, and it's used by the church to give credence to a false uh, idea. It's a good question. Yes, no, and it's important to know these things. And, you, and if you look at church history, you can trace how these things happen. It's no surprise that it does happen. Carlene? Um, there are Baptist churches all over. I'm just trying to understand. Yep. So how, how does one assume the, like the Baptist ideology? Like how do you decide we're going to be Baptist instead of something else, instead of an independent? And if there are relationships is it just that one Baptist church reaches out to another and kind of form informal relationships since there is no head? Yes. Now, now yeah, that's a great p- question. The question is, then, how do you come to these Baptistic policies and how do you fellowship since there's not a head? So there are Baptist organizations like the Fellowship and the Convention and Southern Baptist churches, and they do have a head, right? There is. And so they have fellowship and unity within those circles for sure. Um, but they don't exclude fellowship from independent Baptists. And the, the, when you start talking about Baptists, there's a lot of American Baptists, independent Baptists, Southern Baptists. We just like giving ourselves names all the time, right? And so, but there's a, a loose knit with independence that we feel free to fellowship with lots of different churches um, who, with us, appreciate the gospel of Jesus Christ. So how do we get to this? Like for me, I grew up in this, this movement. So for me, I was born into this. But I think as you look at Scripture, we'll talk about this um, not this week, but the following week. Men like Smith, who came to the conclusions they came to, was because they were literally studying the Word of God and saying, okay, here's what the Bible says about what it means to be a member of a church, like part of a church. And what they were fighting against for the Church of England was that um, you were born, you were baptized, you were part of the church. And in their culture... At that time, if you were not in the church, you couldn't vote in civil government for many of these places, right? And it was the church and the state were almost identical. And so as, as men like Smith began reading the Word of God, they understood that being baptized as an infant is not salvation. It's not. You, you can't, biblically, you cannot find that because salvation is repenting and believing. Infants can't do that. And baptism has always come after salvation, like when I profess my faith in Christ. So as men like that saw those things, and as they, they looked at Scripture, they went back to those movements. And I guess they gave themselves the name Baptist because in that time with the church, because all churches baptize. All churches baptize. And baptism doesn't make us unique. We'll talk about that later on. Regenerated church membership is what makes us more unique. And so I, I think the moniker of the name comes from that idea of baptism I don't know if I've answered your question, though. I, th- I think I'm rambling right now. I am rambling. Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, mm. How do you just decide that we're going to be Baptists instead of Pentecostals? And I think we've decided how... Okay, that's better. Okay, sorry, because I didn't even answer your question. So, um, so how do you decide that? We have decided that as we've looked at Scripture, we believe that Baptistic policy and doctrine lines up better with the word of God. And, and listen, when I say that, I'm saying this. We are Baptist with a small b, not a capital B. We're not saying that we have a corner on all the truth 
and we are the only ones that are doing it right. That's not, and I would never say that. There are born-again believers in all churches. Catholic churches have born-again believers. Reformed churches have born-again believers. Presbyterian, Pentecostals, they, they have, and Reformed. Did I say Reformed already? I said it twice. We have so many here. Um, that, that they have believers. And so we're not saying that we have a corner on truth at all. We love our brothers and sisters in evangelical churches who are born again. But what we're saying is, as we've looked at Scripture, we have reasons why we believe what we believe. And we have reasons why we're different from other churches. And what I, what I hope that this class does for many of our people who are coming is that you can see clearly, it's not like we just decided something because we didn't like what was going on there or those, that group there, or we just want to be part of something. We have decided that what the Bible says is this, this, and this. And so now we want to line up with what the Bible says in these areas. We really, I'll talk about it in a minute, but we want to be people of the book. And so when we make decisions, we want to go back to what the Word of God says to say, this is what the Bible says, so how do we now practically put that into play as a church? So is that a better answer for you? And, and, and Carlene, I think as we go through, you might, it might become more clear as we talk today about what it means to be the church and then what it means and, and why it is that we are Baptists in our, in our doctrinal statements and in our practices. But that's a great question. Anything else? So I probably confused a bunch of people with my rambling this morning. All right, good question. We talked last week about our culture um, because this is how we came. Like, this is the line we follow for our church. But what about the culture of the church? And we said last week, we do want to be people of the book, um, not to be pragmatic, not to be dictated by our culture, or just to, to, to do what's ever easy. We want to follow Scripture. And here's, we believe that Scripture is, is all sufficient. It's sufficient. Listen to what the Bible says about um, church structure. Because it has something to say. It tells us about corporate meetings that we gather together. It tells us how to elect officers of the church, which there are only two, elders and deacons. It tells us about church discipline, which no one talks about anymore, which we practice and which the church practiced early on. It talks about contributions, how they collected money, how they gave, how they supported. Uh, It talks about um, uh, the two ordinances that Jesus Christ gave to. We'll see them both today, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And then it gives you qualifications for the, that leadership. You don't just grab somebody. Um, therefore, we ought to structure our church in accordance with Scripture. And that's what we want to do. Listen to this statement by Justin Martyr in 100 AD. 100 AD, right? The Apostle John maybe just died or is still alive. 100 AD, Justin Martyr writes what the early church did. So it's kind of important, right? Here's what he says. On Sunday, we meet and listen to the apostles and the prophets. That's what they did. And then he said, the president, which was their elder, gets up and encourages members to live by what we just heard. That's the early church. And that should be the modern church. We gather together, we read the apostles and the prophets, and we tell each other how we're supposed to live in light of that. Too many times in churches, we want to be academic or traditional, and we don't want to talk about how we live. And that's problematic. Because the Bible was given to us not to fill our heads with knowledge, but to change our hearts and our lives. And so that's what they did. And so as we hear the word, we listen and follow. And as we do, the church begins to look like the person they're listening and following, and that is Jesus Christ. And that's the plan of the early church. So uh, that's our culture as far as the word of God. We talked last week about the gospel of Jesus Christ, that, that there will not be a service that you come to here, that you will not hear a reference or an explanation of the gospel. The gospel is everything. And the gospel is not just the beginning. We talked about this last week. But the, the gospel is everything. Do you know in the gospel, of course we have eternal life, but the gospel tells us about forgiveness, reconciliation, our identity, our worth, our value. All those things are included in the gospel. So we preach the gospel. And then finally we said last week about our culture. It's a culture of love and unity. And we certainly will talk more about that in the future. 
but we want to be a place where we actually come together of all different types, and we love people like Jesus commanded us to love people. We'll talk more about that. So um, just so you know, um, we all come out of dysfunction, all of us. I, I don't care what you think about your perfect home and family. All of us are broken. All of us come out of dysfunction. All of us have been raised in homes where we don't come out unscathed. Even my kids, and they're messed up, right? Could you imagine me as your father? Uh, terrible. We, but the problem often is we take these things that we grew up with and we bring them into a church and we think that it should be as dysfunctional as my family was. And it should not be. This is a new humanity. And we work things, these things out. And there's some people that join churches and they want to cause a fuss and want to have fights. They want to be offended. And we don't do that here. We don't. And if you do, we talk to you about it. Because we want you to be reconciled to Christ and one another. And so that is our culture. It's a culture of the word, of the gospel, and of love. And again, and I'm not trying to be arrogant, but, but for some of you, you might not want that. And that's okay. And that's okay. That's why we have different churches. So that's, that's from last week. Any questions or comments about that? Okay, let's move on then. We talked about the early church and how we came to be. Let's look at that this morning by looking at Acts chapter 2. Um, Ronald had asked for homework last week. Thank you, Ronald. Did, I don't know if you're going to ask if anyone did it, all right? Ronald, did you do it? Because <laughs> you knew it was coming. You knew it was coming. Um, Acts chapter 2, and let me get my glasses on. Verse, we'll start, let me see where we're at. Start with verse 14, Acts 2, to give you the context. This is 50 days after um, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, prior to this, Peter has denied the Lord three times. Um, Christ resurrected. Uh, Peter's life was changed once again, and we see the redemption of God in the life of Peter here, because in verse number 14, here is Peter, and he says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea and all you that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. And now Peter's going to go off and, and preach the first message of the beginning of the church. This is important. And so he tells them about what they did, how they crucified Christ, and who Christ is. Um, they hear the message, and you should read it. It's great. We'll, we'll talk about it again today, this morning in Acts chapter 10. But he preaches the gospel to them, and in verse number 41, they hear the story, the message, and here's what happens. There's huge crowds there. Then they that gladly received his word, Peter's preaching the gospel of Christ, they receive it, they believe it, they trust in Christ, were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers, and fear came upon every soul, as many and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together and had all things common. They sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And so this is the beginning of the church. This is important. So if we want to know what the church is and what it looks like and how it should behave and how we should do things, we come to Peter's message at the beginning, and here's what we find first and foremost. Um, the church's very existence is unified or unites around the message of a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the King. Uh, Peter's message to the crowds was simply this. Jesus Christ is Lord. He came, he lived, he died, he rose again. There is no other Savior. It is Jesus Christ. He is King. And the only way of salvation is through his name. There is no other way. It is not in your... And he's talking to religious Jews. Pharisees. People who kept the law. Who did wonderful works. Who were separated. 
we have a negative connotation about Pharisees because Christ really laid into them, many of them. But the truth is, Pharisee, a Pharisee was someone who was separated because earlier than this, um, when the Greeks were coming in, they wanted to be pure. And so they separated. And that's not a bad thing. Unfortunately, in the separation, they started adding things and drawing bigger lines and adding to their tradition to the Word of God. But, but these were religious people, and, and Peter is preaching and says, it, salvation comes through Jesus Christ. He is all in all. And so the church of Jesus Christ must unify and rally around one person. Not the pastors, not the elders, but Jesus Christ and Christ alone. He is the prize. He is the reward. And I have to tell you, if you're not into Jesus, you you won't be happy here. We're into Jesus. Because he's all in all. So the early church, the first message is all about Christ. Secondly, here's what we find. Not only is the church unified about one person, it's Jesus. Number two, the church is made up of born-again believers. Born-again believers. Verse 41 says, And they who received the word, received the word, which means they believe the message that Christ is the only way They were old enough to believe. They made the decision on their own. They were born again. Born again. They knew Christ. And these are the people that you will see who are added to the church. The church is to be made up of regenerated people. And I have to tell you, the problem in many churches today is their membership is made up of regenerated and unregenerated people. And it's really hard for unregenerated people, not hard, it's impossible for unregenerated people to be led by the Spirit, to love people, to look for unity, real unity in Christ, because they don't belong to Him. And granted, we have people in our church, I'm sure, who are part of our membership who could be lost. Yes. But we take great strides to say, listen, This is what the church is. We center around Christ, and the real church of Jesus Christ is made up of regenerated believers. You are not a member of a true church because you were born into it, or baptized as an infant, or you give lots of money in the community, or you've been successful in your business. None of that stuff matters. It is regenerated believers, right? So we rally around Christ. It's unified in him. The church is made up of born-again believers. Any questions on that? I don't want to just run through this. Number three, the first step of the Christian life in verse 41. So they believe. What's the first step then in the Christian life? You're baptized. Don't get the order wrong. And you may say this sounds really simplistic. But for lots of people, this is not simplistic. But if you want to look at the early church, Peter preaches the gospel. People are saved. When they're converted, they then are baptized. They're baptized. 3,000 people that day trusted Christ. They were baptized. Um, And and listen, just that you know, this was not, you say, oh, of course, they were, no, these were Jews. These were Jews. And, and honestly, for them, there was, there was baptism, but, but the baptism that they would equate this with was the baptism of a Gentile being converted to Judaism, which meant you're washing away all your filth. And so for them, this is huge. And even today, a Jew or a Muslim, they can make a profession of Jesus Christ, but the day they're dunked, it's done. Because now they are identifying with Jesus and his people. It is an identity marker. And think, we'll see it today. One of the most beautiful services we have, well, we'll see them, it's today. Communion and baptism. And you will clearly see in the tank, it it identifies with Jesus. I am buried in the likeness of his death. I am raised in the likeness of his resurrection to walk in newness of life. And that's what every believer in this, the beginning of the church, did, right? And let me just say to you, um, 
Getting wet is the easiest commandment that you will ever get from Jesus. It gets harder after that. Much harder. And so they got wet. So they, they're identified with Jesus. And then this is important. They're identified with the church. Just read what happens. They received the word, they were baptized, and then they were added to the church. Added to the church. They were identified with the body of Jesus. There was no one in the early church who wondered after conversion to Jesus if they, one, should be baptized, or two, if they should be part of an assembly. That that wasn't on the table. It's on the table for us today. But for the early church, when they received the word and were saved, they were baptized. And when they were baptized, they were placed into a body of believers. They were identifying with Jesus and his body. Now listen, the, the church has taken lots of flack, and rightly so. I think we have all been in bad churches, except if you were born in this church. Then you're in a good church. But we've all been in bad churches where where things were done that shouldn't have been done. And so people have this attitude like, yeah, I love Jesus, but I can't stand the church. And and I understand part of that mentality because you have seen abuse or trouble or turmoil in a church. And when the church is done well, it's it's the greatest thing in the world. When the church is done poorly, it's hell on earth. It's, It's terrible. But listen to me. You can't divide Jesus, the head, from his body. So, um, if you said to me, Rick, I really like you, but your wife, eh, that never happens to me. It's always the other way around. We really like him, you, eh, right? But if you said to me, we like you, but we can't stand your bride, then we have no relationship. No matter how well you like me, or respect me, or give me gifts, or see me every week, You can't love me without loving my bride, right? You can't love Jesus truly without loving his church because he died for the church. And if it's it's messed up, we got to make it right. We have to work hard at this. I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm telling you that the early church, this is what they did. They were saved. They were baptized. They were added to a body of believers to do life together. And and some of you are thinking, like, yeah, it's a no-brainer. But I'm telling you, this is why we do what we do here. Because that's what the early church did, right? So they were baptized, added to the church. Number four, and realize this, the church, when we say the church, the church is, is not a building. The church is its members. If you're born again this morning, you are part of the church, Universally, of course, everyone who comes to Christ, there is a sense of the universal church that every believer in Christ is in that body. And so the church is not a building. Um, you, didn't, you didn't come to church today. You came to a building at 500 Indian Creek. When you came in today, you are the church. You and I are the church. That's why the early Puritans would call the church the meeting house. They didn't call it the church. They called it the meeting house because they understood as we gather, we are the church. And so the church is made up of its membership. And I want you to know this. Um, aye, aye, aye. I talk too much. Um, uh, membership. The early church certainly recognized that certain people would have been known to make up the assembly. It wasn't like there's a big crowd, everyone showed up, we don't know who these people are. The early church would have known that. They would have known that the people who are showing up were blood-bought brothers and sisters in Christ, um, that it was his church, his people, uh, they were doing life together, they were giving a witness of the love and salvation of Christ, they were redeemed and regenerated, Um, And they knew who belonged to them. And if you doubt this, um, Acts chapter 2 gives numbers. Why would he have to say, and 3,000 were added to the church? How did they know that? Someone was counting. Someone was watching. Someone knew who was coming into the church. And then later you find in in Acts chapter, I think it's 6, where there's a problem with 
um, certain widows who were not Hebrews, but Hellenistic or, or Grecian widows were not being treated fairly. And so they had to correct that, which was right. But they knew which widows were theirs. They knew who was part of that assembly. It wasn't every widow in Jerusalem. It was the ones in the church who they were accountable for and to. And um, it is clear that the early church knew that there would be some people that would be excluded from the fellowship. Matthew chapter 18, you put people out of the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, if there's immorality and the people aren't repenting, they need to be disciplined by the church. And so I want you to know that the early church knew who belonged to them. They were their members. Members. And so I want to just take this next point for a minute and uh, just talk a little bit about membership because um, we're big on membership and I think the culture of our, our day has ruined the idea of what it means to be a member of a church. Um, this is a topic that, that church growth people say leave alone. Don't talk about membership. Don't talk about commitment. Don't talk about people being accountable to one another and being in covenant. If the church is big and the church is growing, leave it alone. Don't touch it. But here's the problem. First off, that's not biblical. And secondly, we are more concerned with our members than the number of our members. Right? We're more concerned with how our people that we're accountable for are growing than the number of people in our church. It's important. And, and we have this idea today that, that church membership is almost like Costco membership. I love Costco. I love it. Sometimes I hate it because we spend too much money there, but I love it. But in Costco membership, you pay some money, and when you pay the money, you go and you get the services, and, and there's really no commitment. If you go there someday and you're not happy, you just walk away from it. And so we have believed that church membership is the same. That, hey, I'm there, and as long as the music is good, as long as I'm not offended, as long as no one hurts me, as long as the preaching is okay, we'll stay. But the first time the service provider doesn't do for you, or someone upsets you, or rubs you the wrong way, you're gone. That's not church membership. That's a consumer mentality. But I will stay as long as you're doing something for me. That's not the church. We come to die to self and give ourselves for one another. Um, I, have to, I have to wrap this up because our baptism people are here. Um, the church is not a service provider at all. The church is a body of believers who are committed together, who are going to do life together, and who, who will be accountable to one another. And one of the problems we have in our society is no one wants to be held accountable for anything. But do you understand in the Christian life, there is no real growth until iron sharpens iron, until we hold ourselves accountable. Listen, there are things in my life that I cannot see because I think I got it all together. Until my wife says, hey, Rick, or brother or sister says, hey, the way you responded or what you said or how are you doing in this area of your life, we all need that. And the idea of being a member of a church means I am saved, I am baptized, I've been added to this local assembly, and we're going to do life together, and we're going to be accountable to one another and to, to, to urge each other to grow in holiness and godliness. And it's important. And so I'm going to stop with that because there's, there's much more to say on this. Um, but membership is important to us. Being part of this church and saying we are in covenant together. We're going to do life together. And this becomes more important as this church grows. I cannot give myself equally to everyone in this church. I can't. I, I couldn't do that a long time ago. It's impossible. It's impossible. Pastor Dan can't do that. Our other elders cannot do that. So when, when needs and problems arise, we got to say, who are we accountable for? Who are our sheep? Who, who, who are we supposed to be leading and correcting and loving? Because we can't do it to everyone. It's not my job to do it for everyone. I'm not accountable for other churches or their membership or other believers who aren't part of this covenant community. We love them. Um, we want to help them. But when push comes to shove, the only people I'm responsible for are the sheep of this flock. And I hope you understand. I'm not trying to be unkind. 
But that's the reality of the world. That's the, that's the reality of the word and the world we live in, right? So any questions on that before we stop? I know we're not ending on a super happy, encouraging, like, woohoo, that was great, but this is the truth. And, and I want you to know, you need to know, this is what we're about, and this is why our church runs the way it does, because this is what we see from Scripture, and we want to be right. And, and let me just say this. We have reformed it. For, over the years, we have made changes that the church has always done. We'll talk about that when we talk about our, our elders and our deacons. But we want to be honest with the Word, and we want to be able to say, this is what the Word says. I can defend why we do this, because this is what the Bible says, and that's what it means for us to follow uh, in the policies we do. Okay, anything else? Yes, go ahead, Jack. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right? Right? Yeah, it hits the fan after two weeks. Right. That's the reality of life. The Christian life is not just an eternal high that you keep on going, gaining new heights every day. It's trouble. And so the baptism thing is the first act of obedience, the first command he gives us, and it's the easiest one. It's hard for many of you. I know. There's family connections. And there's issues that you have to struggle through, but that's what the Word of God says. Good. Anything else? All right. God bless you. Uh, most of you came back from last week. That's awesome. Um, we'll do it again next week. We'll see what our numbers look like then. God bless you. Get ready for church. We're going to get baptism coming up in just a moment. Thank you for listening. If you would like to learn more about what you've just heard or are interested in the ministry of Maple City, please visit our website at maplecitybaptistchurch.com.